Arcade Heroes. So 1984 was a pretty interesting year in the amusement arcade business, and this is because prior to that, from 1972 to 1982, you had pretty much nothing but explosive growth in the arcade business, the video game business in general. Uh, it even reached a point where it was hauling in a lot more money than movies were. But in 1983, it all came to a head and the bubble burst. Just the reasons for that are varied. Some people that are lazy, that don't do any research, think it was just Atari releasing E.T. and that caused the crash to happen. But, um, it was a glut of bad software, plus you had about eight dedicated consoles on the market at the time. You had high-end computers, which were really just glorified game consoles, game consoles with a keyboard attached to them, but a lot of them had cartridge ports on them as well. Uh, and so you just had all these options at home, plus a lot of bad software that eventually just the market burned out, and plus arcades as well. And while arcades generally had the top of the line games, the best games, they also had their shovelware. That all collapsed in 1983, a lot of businesses had to close, but a lot survived. And the problem was is that you had a lot of game cabinets on the market. And so to give you an idea, uh, Pac-Man was manufactured in around at a, the tune of 100,000 units, Miss Pac-Man, the same number. Um, the Atari's Asteroids was around 60,000 units, many others were 30, 40,000 uh, in manufactured sales. And so these all went to places, and not just 7-Elevens, but uh, other arcades. But for the arcades that would survive the crash, they just had a glut of cabinets sitting around. And so if a new game would come along, it wasn't very appealing to have to make space for that or sometimes you just couldn't and so what happened in many instances were, was that games were simply thrown into the dumpster to make room for the new games that hopefully would earn again and so to tackle this issue this problem that the industry was experiencing they different manufacturers came up with the idea of conversion kits now 84 wasn't the first time that a conversion kit was released but it just wasn't very common prior to this Sometimes you would get a, a conversion kit that would come along that would plug into the same cabinet so you wouldn't have to do any rewiring. Um, I know with uh, games like Lunar Lander, the, a lot of those were converted into asteroids. Um, and there was a few other games like that too. But 80, 1984 is when the idea of the conversion kit really started to take hold. And then a couple years later you had what was called the JAMA standard or JAMA wiring standard. Uh, as it, with some kits in 1984, you might have had to rewire the whole cabinet to get it to work right. And so the JAMA standard was created so that it could almost be a plug-and-play type thing. In some instances it would be. But you had more standardized cabinets throughout the 80s and 90s. And then conversion kits would come with artwork uh, or maybe even a new control panel if the game was going to use some sort of different control panel. But that way it allowed operators to switch a game out, refresh it, possibly get some new, better earnings out of it without having to throw the whole cabinet away. Now, conversion kits have existed since that time in different numbers. In recent years, and throughout the 2000s, since the market crashed in 2002, they haven't really been very common. Most manufacturers have preferred to sell just dedicated cabinets. They make more money off them, to be honest. And so they just haven't really had, the conversion kit hasn't been very appealing to them. And then in the Japanese market, you've also had a little bit of an issue too, where it used to be Japan was the region that gave us the most conversion kits or PCBs or hardware boards that you could get, or whether you're a collector or an arcade operator, and swap it out on a new machine. But uh, in around 2009, 2010, I think it was, uh, you started getting digital distribution networks. And so these would lock the games behind uh, the different online security features. So and while there were workarounds, it wasn't very easy to do. Or you also had in uh, especially in Japan, you had problems with revenue sharing. Now, for the manufacturers, it was awesome. They would make 30 to 50 percent of what an arcade would make off of that game, uh, and then the operator would have to keep a lot less. And so, this is an issue that's caused 
a lot of challenges for Japanese arcades because you already have a lot of costs involved with an arcade business. You have your rent, you have your wages, you have your electrical bills, your insurance, taxes, uh, maintenance, all those things that you already have to cover. And then for a lot of these games that would start coming out to the Japanese market, now you had to pay manufacturers even more. You had to buy the hardware and then you had to keep paying them. So for every dollar that would be spent, or every yen, I guess you could say, or 100 yen, uh, you did not keep 30 to 50 percent of that. And unfortunately that became the norm for almost all games as conversion kits simply went away and everything was replaced with digital networks like uh, Nessica Cross Live or All.Nes Plus Multi. Um, and Bandai Namco also has their thing with Bandai Passport. Uh, Konami has their e-amusement stuff. And so it's created a really difficult challenge for arcades. So, what is the point of all of this history lesson here? So, recently you've probably read or heard about, or seen on this channel, stuff about the Exa Arcadia platform. So this was designed specifically to address this issue, this challenge uh, that Japanese and American and European operators have, in that we've been offered a lot of options in recent years as far as dedicated cabinets go, but we haven't had these lower cost, easy to get your hands on kits. Normally conversion kits are supposed to cost a lot less than dedicated cabinets. The average cost on a new, brand new arcade machine is probably around $8,000. That's been ticking up in recent years as arcade manufacturers have been wanting bigger, better, more expensive games, and unfortunately, in, in many instances, less content on the software side, but a lot more flash and dazzle on the cabinet side. Uh, and this has been driving costs up, and of course we've seen more and more games reach the $30,000 dollar price range or even higher than that and even on the Japanese market there have been some games like that as well and so while that's great for places like Dave and Buster's around one USA or any other company that seems to have unlimited funds uh, for a small arcade like the one that I'm in or street operations um, it's just not feasible to constantly be buying all of these gigantic super expensive games and so I remember a few years ago I was at Amusement Expo and I was approached by an operator there who's been operating out of Nevada for decades and he was asking me, where's the conversion kits? Uh, we need something like a kit so we can take one of these games that stopped earning and refresh it with something new like we used to do. And so that's what XR Arcadia does and overall XR Arcadia I like to compare it to something like the Neo Geo MVS uh, or you could also think of the Play Choice 10 or there's a number of other multi-game systems out there that have existed in the, in the past that um, allowed a lot more content to come out to the market. And so XR Arcadia, I'm very excited for this. I won't uh, <laughs> Uh, hold back on that. I, I know I'm chilling for it a, a little bit here, but it's because for an operator like me, a small independent operator, I really see the potential. Uh, but even from the, uh, the news side, just to give you an example, if you go into Arcade Heroes right now, and on the top banner you see the different categories and you see new releases, you click on that. And if you look at 2019, I mean, we're still in January when I'm filming this. And normally at the beginning of the year, we only have a few games, a handful of games, maybe like 10 or something like that, that are on the list as far as coming soon. Uh, and then by the end of the year, we might reach 20 to 35 games. And if you click on the previous years, which I've been tracking since 2009, you can count through them and see that we've averaged since 2009 about 20 to 30 games per year. But with the X Arcadia uh, already in January 2019, uh, we have a total of 34 games at present on the, for the North American region. 23 of those come from X Arcadia. Uh, if it wasn't for those, we'd only have 11 games announced right now. And of course, as X Arcadia launches and more developers jump on board and more content comes our way, that can stand to grow even further. And so, I mean, the potential here for content and coming at us at a much lower price point than a dedicated cabinet, I mean, that's, that's very appealing because, again, we have a lot of costs. And as much as I would love to get my hands on a brand new, the flashiest, hottest game every time one comes out, I just can't afford to do that. 
Um, but with XR Arcadia, that will be a lot more reasonable and a lot more possible to do. Now with the XR Arcadia, just a little bit of information on the hardware. The full specs have not been revealed, but it does allow you to include or install four different game cartridges in it, and there are these long stick-like things. I'm not sure how much space each one holds or if they work like the uh, Neo Geo did in allowing uh, RAM or anything like that to uh, be added to them, but the platform itself, um, it, we do know that it has 8 gigabytes of RAM and on a power level it's comparable, possibly even a little better than the uh, PS4 Pro or the Xbox One X. And so it should be capable of doing anything that those platforms can do, possibly even more. Um, I guess it'll depend on the graphics card that they use as well. But uh, it's a capable system. It connects to either JAMA cabinets or JBS. It was designed mainly for the JBS standard, which um, maybe not too many uh, people know about in North America. It was very common in Japan with systems like the Naomi standard. Or, sorry, the Naomi board on standard. But uh, JBS is, is somewhat similar to JAMA, and there's JBS IO boards out there, and so it'll plug in through that. But uh, yeah, this will give arcades a ample opportunity to grow and expand and offer a lot more options. So let's get into some of those games, some of those 23 announced games so far. Um, and, or actually, I'm sorry, it's uh, 24 games here. So um, I'll play this sizzle reel as I talk about these games, and it's not the only, uh, this, or, sorry, the, the sizzle reel doesn't show everything that's on there, but uh, it shows pretty much most of everything. So we'll, we'll start with the A's, and we'll go from there. So the first game that was announced for the XR platform was Aka and Blue Type R. And so this was available on phones, and it does have some unique features to it. And a nice thing about the arcade versions and EXA is that it supports vertical or Tate, as uh, uh, shoot 'em up fans usually call it. So it's a, a vertical screen, so you have more space for firing, but it also supports horizontal mode. Um, so depending on how you have your cabinet set up, you can do either one. Uh, but you don't have to go and change the screen for people, um, the, the physical orientation of the screen for people. You just set it up as is. And if you want to run four games in vertical mode, then you can do that. Uh, and they have several games to be able to fit that build. But Aka and Blue Type R is one of those. That's by Tano Shimasu. Uh, you have Akios Exa. This had previously been called Valkyrius Exa. Um, but also, this is a bullet hell type shooter, as you can probably see in the footage. Uh, gets a little bit crazy, just like uh, Akam Blue Type R, but uh, these games are looking to revitalize the STG or shoot 'em up game market, uh, especially in Japan, but uh, also here as well. I think there's a good place for that to be able to grow. Uh, you have Alien Field 3671. I'm not too familiar with this. I'm not familiar with the original game that this is based on, that this is remaking, so um, I, I tried to look it up a little bit, but it's so obscure it really doesn't have a lot of information about it out there. Uh, so we'll, we'll figure that out as time goes on. Uh, you have Axel City 2, and Axel City 2 is a fighting game, and I believe this was made in Fighter Fighting Maker 2002 or uh, something along those lines might be a newer one, uh, but uh, this one has a roster of over 40 fighters, and so I guess one question out there is how is that going to be balanced? I don't know, but uh, that one does fill the niche of a 2D fighter. And also speaking of fighters, next up on the list is Bayani, and this is an interesting one. This one was kickstarted a few years ago and it was slated for a PC release in early 2019, uh, but now it will be coming to the EXA platform and it looks a little bit like the Street Fighter 4 style graphics, uh, maybe a little bit different. Uh, looks to me like they use some cell shading, but it's 3D models, but of course on the 2D playing field. Uh, and so this uses Filipino myths and legends for the settings and the characters, and uh, does look very interesting. And one that I'm also excited about is Blazing Chrome. Blazing Chrome is by a company called Joy Masher, and this is a lot like Contra uh, from the looks of it. And so this is also was in development for 
home consoles or PC, but uh, we come into EXA, not sure what unique features it will have, but if you're into run and gun games like Contra, then this fills that need beautifully from the looks of things. Uh, we also have Devil Engine AC, and this is it was announced last year, I think September of last year, uh, for several consoles, but also the uh, Arcadia platform. And so this is a side-scrolling shoot 'em up, and a little bit of uh, cell shaded look to everything, but 2D, I believe, and uh, so it looks pretty intense and fun. You have Dimension Drive EX, and so some shoot 'em up fans may also be familiar with Dimension Drive. And so also not sure what will make this version of the game unique, but if you're into that series or just shoot em ups in general, then you'll get that. Next up on the list is one that uh, caused a little bit of controversy, and that is uh, when it was released on consoles, and that is Fight of Gods by Digital Crafter. And so this takes uh, different gods, uh, whether from myth or belief, that and pits them against each other, so you can have battles of Jesus versus Zeus, or Zeus versus Buddha, or anything like that, and so uh, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, I'm sure, I've not, I've not played that one, but a 3D fighter on a 2D playing field, and so uh, should be interesting to see how that one's received on the arcade market. And then the one that's probably generated the most interest that I've seen so far. Um, now, I'll admit, I had never heard of this game before. I grew up playing on the NES. It didn't have one at home, but everybody around me did in my neighborhood. Um, but uh, there was an NES game released very late in the lifespan, and that's where it got overlooked. Um, and I don't know if it really got a lot of reach in the United States, but I guess it was big in Japan, and that was called Gimmick, or Mr. Gimmick. Uh, by Sunsoft, and so uh, now Sunsoft is back and they are recreating Gimmick for the Exa platform. It's called Gimmick Exact Mix, and this one, it, um, I've seen some people saying, oh, it looks like they've just filtered the graphics, but actually according to the game designer on Twitter, uh, they have recreated all of the graphics by hand, and you can also switch between the old NES style and the new HD graphics. But it's still very early in development. I'm not sure how early exactly, but um, if you're into platformers, cutesy platformers especially, that uh, are going to give you a little bit of a challenge or speed running, that sort of thing, then uh, it should be very interesting to see how people take to uh, this new gimmick uh, version. Uh, and I, as far as I'm also aware, this is not the only retro remake that's in the works for the Exa platform, but can't say anything more than that at the moment, especially since we don't have some confirmations on things, but yeah, keep an eye out for that. Uh, we also have Hayanku, Hayankyo Alien 3671, uh, uh, overseas it'll be known as Cosmic Digger 3671, and so this was the first four-player game, or one to four player game that was announced for EXA. And so when the X Arcadia launches in the States, it's going to have a dedicated four player cabinet available, from what I'm told. Of course it'll still be available as a conversion kit, so you can swap those things out, but uh, I haven't seen the four player cabinet yet, but very, very interested to see what that's going to look like and how that's going to work. But Cosmic Digger 3671 will be one of those games that will be tailored for that cabinet and if you're not familiar with that game it also was a bit obscure um, the original came out in 1980 and it was kind of like a cross between uh, Load Runner if you if you remember that one and Pac-Man and so you had a maze and you would go around and you could start digging holes that to trap the aliens in and then if the alien got trapped um, one difference from Load Runner, Load Runner, those holes would fill themselves, but in Cosmic Digger, you had to go back and fill the hole back up. And so, uh, a little slower pace than Load Runner, I suppose you could say, but uh, yeah, this one will now have uh, new neon graphics, HD graphics, and uh, several other features, and of course, four player play uh, should be make for some interesting matches. Then we have Infinos, Infinos, Exa, I'll say Infinos, <laughs> and this is a game that's a lot like uh, the side-scrolling shoot-em-ups from the Genesis, Sega Genesis era, or Sega Mega Drive if you're in Europe. Um, 
probably games like Thunder Force and whatnot, and it certainly captures that feel of the Sega Genesis game. And uh, I believe this is the one that was designed by a guy who was a fisherman. Um, it's either that or Super High Dora. I can't remember exactly. But if you're into side-scrolling shoot 'em ups that aren't exactly bullet hell games, uh, something a little more early '90s, then this uh, should fit the bill. Uh, and the next one that I'm quite excited about is because I, I love RPGs, love arcade RPGs like Gauntlet. It's just we've never had a lot of success with arcade RPGs, uh, and Gauntlet's almost one of the few. And you have Dungeons and Dragons and a couple of others. Uh, in Japan, there there's a lot of RPGs, but overseas, over here, we just never get them, any, especially these days. But uh, Lightning Knights by Tiki Pod, and so this is described as a cross between Gauntlet and Smash TV. <laughs> and so uh, I'm not sure if it would allow you to have a dual joystick setup on that, or if it'll be more like the Berserk style control. That's what I imagine it would be, where just wherever you're pointing, that's when you push the fire button to throw your weapon. But it is still an RPG, a lot more action-packed, faster-paced, and so uh, very, very interested to see how this one would do. And it's another four-player game, so it would be uh, perfect for those four-player cabinets. Um, but uh, when I saw this, I also kind of wondered if uh, this is where Raw Thrills, maybe they should support the uh, X-Arcadia platform with uh, Next Machina, as they had teased an arcade version of that, but I guess it just didn't test well or something, and then of course the developer's house mark started talking about how arcades are dead or whatever just because they didn't sell it in a manner that they had hoped, but uh, perhaps it was just the wrong platform. Uh, and then next up is My Slam and Jam. This is another four player, one to four player game, and as uh, you can notice from the footage here, it is a lot like NBA Jam. Now this is a mobile game that was launched in 2015 for the Philippines Basketball Association, which I admit I had no idea existed, <laughs> but uh, this version will allow players to take their face like, from their phone and it'll be mapped onto the players there and you can also create your own team logos and then you just have an NBA, NBA Jam style match, a uh, basketball match and I guess the slam dunks are a little over exaggerated in this one but uh, very interesting to see how that one also uh, pans out. One that wasn't shown at the JPO event, the Japan Amusement Expo, which I guess I should have mentioned at the beginning, this is where a lot of this stuff has come from, uh, is Ninja Soldier by M2. And so that had been talked about a little earlier in 2018, but not much is known about it other than originally it was in development for arcades back in 1988 and it just was never released. But I guess uh, whoever it is at M2 that uh, was going through some old boxes found the design documentation, found uh, maybe some of the assets, and so they've been working on putting that together. And so it's a vertical scrolling shoot 'em up with a ninja theme to it. And so it uh, should be interesting to see that one make its way to the exit platform. And then another one to four player game, and this one is definitely fits in the, the vein of party games, is Nippon Marathon Turbo Hyper Running by Onion Soup Interactive. And so this is a uh, quirky running game, uh, like an obstacle course game. And so one to four players uh, take on an obstacle course with a lot of hazards and just try and get to the finish line first. And so with that, I really do imagine that we'll see some uh, shouting and cheering at the arcades as you tend to get with really good four-player games when everybody's packed on the machine. Uh, <laughs> so definitely looking forward to that one. Uh, and then back into the shoot 'em ups, you have Cyvariar, uh, I believe is how you say that. If I butchered that, my apologies. Cyvariar uh, Delta, and so that is by City Connection, who's the IP holder of Jayoko's old IP. And so it's uh, going to be very interesting to see how shoot 'em up fans take to uh, this platform where it has some of these well known names on it. And so you can get Savari or Delta on Steam right now, but as mentioned, there should be some unique uh, features to this one when it launches on Exa, so look forward to that. 
and also in the area of a shoot 'em up game. And this one I find interesting because it is a little different, and that is Rival Mega Gun XE by Space Wave Studios. So this takes the concept of something like Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo and combines it with a shoot 'em up. And so you have the screen split and as you have enemies come down, you blast them and it sends things over to your opponent's screen and so it's really you're trying to defeat your opponent by shooting better than they are and so it's a pretty cool concept, definitely should work well for arcades. That's something worth mentioning too is that all these concepts that X has taken on, um, they've rejected some concepts because they didn't feel that it would work out in arcades and so they're trying to focus on things that they believe will work and then they test out first to make sure that it is accepted in arcade environments. And so this is definitely one of those. Uh, and then next up back into the bullet hell style shoot 'em up era area is uh, Shikondo Red Pur Purga Purgatory, sorry, uh, by Deer Farm. And so I haven't seen a whole lot of details on this one other than the footage there, but uh, I do like the art style. Um, looks nice and detailed. Uh, keep my eyes out for that one in more details. Uh, another one that is in the shoot 'em up area but is a bit more well known, it was released on consoles uh, several years ago, uh, is Strania EX, the Stella Machine. And so I know that there are supposed to be some other features added to this, but there's also a uniquely themed Exa Arcadia board that you can get. Uh, they had pre-orders pre up for a while. They aren't available anymore, but um, throw the picture up here of what that looks like. And so uh, if, you, if you're if you really into Strania by G-Rev, or G.Rev, uh, then uh, this would definitely be a good collector's piece, but that one will be uh, available on Exa pretty early on. Might be a launch title. Then uh, also in shoot 'em ups, but this one is well, Strania was a vertical scrolling uh, shoot 'em up, although it's on a horizontal screen. But uh, the next one is Super Hydora AC, and that's a, a horizontal scrolling shoot 'em up that is very much like Gradius, or Gradius meets a little bit of Darius. And they also have the, uh, a filter over the screen to make it look like it's on a CRT. Um, looks very nice, and I did get a chance to play that one at. Uh, California Extreme 2018 found it to be fun. Definitely a challenge, but fun. And the next one is one that was announced at the very end of JPO, but it just there's not a lot of details on it at this point, other than we know it's coming. But this is the Fallen Angels, and wasn't announced who's working on this, but uh, the Fallen Angels is a somewhat obscure one-on-one -on -one fighting game that was released by Psycho back in 1998. And I don't know if they sold a lot of units. And in fact, I believe it's believed that development wasn't completed on the game, as when it became available on um, on emulation and was found to have four characters inside of the ROM that weren't available in the main gameplay. And I guess some of the staff had left Psycho for uh, SNK uh, near the end of the development cycle, and so uh, just might have been incomplete. So hopefully what we get with the EXA version is fully complete and allow people to enjoy a solid one-on-one -on -one fighter that uh, maybe has some extra stuff thrown into it and possibly may even be 100% exclusive to EXA, which would also be good for us operators. And then another fighting game, this one uh, caught the attention of a lot of people back in June of 2018, that is the Kung Fu vs. Karate Champ. Um, this is available on consoles as uh, Shaolin vs. Wu-Tang, I believe. Uh, but the, the EXA version will have some differences, not just in naming, but also characters. Um, I have footage of this on my channel, and some people weren't very sure about it from that because some of the animations did look very odd, a little janky, <laughs> but uh, in the footage that was shown here in, uh, at, at uh, JPO, it looks a lot smoother, things look a little more polished, and so, and that's what I've also been told, is that it's been polished up quite a bit since then, and so uh, this one I think will appeal to both casual and more hardcore fighting fans, especially if you're into something like Virtua Fighter. Um, it's a little bit more along those lines, and so uh, I had fun with it when I played at uh, California Extreme. And then last but not least is, and this one I'm not 100% sure if I'm saying it right, uh, Vritra Hexa, 
And so this one, what caught my eye about it is I loved Dragon Spirit uh, when I was younger. And so this is like Dragon Spirit, but it's a side-scrolling version. But uh, beautiful HD graphics, lots of cool uh, details in the environments. When I was watching the live stream, I got to an area that had a lot of visceral gore in it. I mean, it wasn't anything that would make anybody throw up, but uh, it, looked, it just looked really cool. But uh, yeah, that covers the whole range of announced EXA games. Um, there was also a hint a while back online from the CEO of uh, EXA Arcadia, Eric Showtime, uh, or Eric Show, and he hinted that Seibu Kai, or he said that Seibu Kaihatsu, who is the creator of the original rating games, uh, was on board with EXA Arcadia, and all they said Apart from that was lightning will rise again and so I think we can safely assume from that that there is a new Raiden I mean maybe it could be Raiden 4 or it could be Raiden 5 or maybe even Raiden 6 um, and if it was Raiden 5 hopefully some of the issues that that one had would be addressed because uh, I know not everybody was very happy with that one but uh, what, whatever's coming to EXA um, at least you have another Raiden shoot them up to look forward to uh, now, a few other things to note on X Arcadia. I know this video is already a little long, but um, the boot time on Exa systems is very short, and so uh, one thing is that it can boot into a game in roughly a minute, whereas there are some modern games which take minutes and minutes and minutes to, to load. Um, Tekken 7 Round 2 takes about 10 minutes to load. Uh, Maximum Tomb 5, I have the US version here, it takes about two and a half minutes. Uh, Big Buck HD sometimes can take over over 10, 15 minutes, depending on if it has an update to, to start with. And that's a nice thing about EXA, is it does not require online. There is no forced revenue share. If you buy the games, you own the games. And so if you're an arcade operator or a collector, you don't have to worry about sending a monthly fee off to anybody based on how much has been played. And so that's a really, really appealing thing, and will be very beneficial to helping arcades stay open. Because again, we can't stay open by magic or by desire alone. It, we have to have cash flow. It has to be coming in for us to keep our doors open. And so if the, everything is being spent on bills or fees, then yeah, you're not going to have it to be able to keep the doors open. And um, last but not least, uh, earnings. Uh, earnings is an important factor for arcade operators. I know for gamers, they probably won't care very much unless you're just interested in game development and how games do on test, but uh, EXA has been tested out on the Japanese market. They've done a lot of work with Mikado Arcade in Tokyo, which is one of the most successful video arcades in Japan, and uh, what's interesting about it is it's a lot like, well, not a lot, but uh, it's like my location where I don't have any ticket redemption, and they don't have the Japanese version of redemption. They don't do metal games. They don't do crane games like UFO Catchers and all that crap. They just do video games. It's a purist place, and uh, they've tested a lot of games there. Um, normally, they're some of their best games are the one-on-one -on -one fighting games like Guilty Gear, um, but when they tested out um, Kung Fu versus Karate Champ, it beat out Guilty Gear, and so Guilty Gear uh, made somewhere, I think they said around $350. This was after the split, it made around $500 gross, but then they had to share some of that money with the manufacturer, or with Nessica, I think it is, and uh, they ended up with only 350 net. But uh, Kung Fu did $600 in, in that week of testing, and they were able to keep all of that. Um, and he also said that all the games that they've tested have done more than 300 per week consistently. Um, Aka and Blue, uh, this is a very impressive number, did over $1,000. Now that's unheard of for a shoot 'em up game. <laughs> now obviously on the Japanese market there's a few more fans out there right, for that sort of thing, but I mean, when I first got Darius Burst and Other Chronicle, it did just as well as my Terminator Salvation did. Now of course at, over time it uh, went down and whereas Terminator was a little more consistent but still I mean if your EXA board is somewhere in the neighborhood of two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars and then the game cartridges cartridges themselves are eight hundred to a thousand dollars I mean if you're able to pull off earnings like that or even half of that your return on investment is still going to be pretty fast I mean in, in this business usually we're happy if we're getting a year's return on investment but if you're able to do it in a few weeks 
you know, then it's a no-brainer, really. Uh, but, yeah, overall, this thing has shown some strong earnings potential. Granted, these numbers are not from the United States yet. Testing hasn't begun in the United States and won't begin until probably the end of February, early March, because um, they're going to be doing more tests in Japan now that they've uh, completed with j -Apple. But either way, this system is coming this year, quarter two, so spring, early summer, and it is coming worldwide. It's not just in the United States that will enjoy this, but Europe as well, or anywhere else in the world that has arcade cabinets that, and has the money to buy one of these, they can set it up and run it. So South America, Middle East, Africa, wherever you're at, uh, you can get your hands on this, and that's what's great about it. It's not locked behind any sort of firewall or paywall or any thing like that and there are going to be some other features that are coming to it which you can't talk about yet they haven't been announced but um, there's a lot there that's made for us operators but also the players that will allow them to get a fuller experience more than just coming in dropping a coin and playing a game uh, but being able to do more uh, than that and so uh, we'll just have to hang tight for all that but overall, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, exhaustive look at what XRCAD is bringing to the market. And be sure to share it around with your friends and spread the word. I mean, we want, uh, I mean, okay, I should be clear, I don't work for XRCADIA. I'm not making anything off of this. This is just my passion for arcades and excitement at seeing the opportunity for more content to finally get out there because I do love like in games and racing games as much as the next guy and for my arcades they're what pays all my bills but as a gamer I've wanted to see fighters again I wanted to see shoot 'em ups I wanted to see RPGs uh, all this stuff uh, because there's a lot you can still do in arcades that's just better to do at the arcade than at home it's just not as fun in some instances at home as it is in the arcade and so that's what I see as exit bringing to the table but also giving us an opportunity to grow and thrive and offer more to our customers uh, more more to gamers out there and uh, revitalize the arcade business even further than what it already has been doing but part of the problem with all those really high prices is the, too much focus is going on FECs on gigantic mega corporations that just again they have unlimited budgets practically and they can throw all the money they want at all the hottest new games but that's causing manufacturers to keep creating bigger new games that are super super expensive and so this is a much more affordable option and so I'm very very excited about that. But again thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned to ArcadeHeroes.com for more news on the XArcadia platform and we'll catch you on the flip side.